Um, good afternoon. As I was saying just a moment ago, we are at the last panel. <laughs> uh, fewer people, but um, active and very enthusiastic participation. I, we expect from everybody here and um, from online. Um, we are uh, starting the last panel of this wonderful conference that Emily Pierini has put together with the support of Sapienza and uh, uh, Marie Curie Fellowship. And the last panel, panel five, is called Therapeutic Pluralism and Trust. Um, unfortunately, uh, Pino Escripa won't be with us today, but everybody else is here. And so the first um, paper is by Paula Bronson from University College of London called My Reputation Means Everything, The Notion of Trust in Shamanic Healing in a Tamang Village in Nepal. Please. Thanks so much, Fania. Um, so this will be self-explanatory with the slides. Um, I'll be reading my ethnography uh, about my time in the village and Again, the, the slides will just kind of be background information relating to what I'm talking about. So thanks so much for inviting me. And um, again, our last afternoon, uh, we had a quick lunch. So apologies for, for a bit of a late start. I enjoyed taking the long way from the village where I was staying on a route to another village nearby. What drew me was a small pond. In the heat of the monsoon season, it was covered with a thin film of green algae with various sized trees lining the shore. An enclosed shrine, Mandir in Nepali, was dominant at one end. No Lungta, Tibetan for wind horse, or prayer flags were outside the Mandir or other typically Buddhist iconography, as was common in the region where the Tamang ethnic group lived. The wooden doors were open. I walked in to see two adorned statues standing about six feet tall. Here Mahadeva stood prominently holding his trident and Parvati, his female consort, stood beside him. At the time, I didn't know the strong connection between the Tamang Bombos, the traditional shamanic healers who called themselves Buddhists, mm -hmm. and Mahadeva Shiva. Later, when I was one told me, um, sorry, a bit of a just a just a sideline, okay. <laughs> um Several months later, I went on a pilgrimage with the Bombos, and one told me, and I quote, they got their power from this lake. This is why we live here. That pilgrimage would be to Panchpokri, where they went every year to a group of five lakes in the mountains at an altitude of 4,117 meters. This site was a source of great power to them, and where the Bombos and Hindu pilgrims also traveled to receive the blessings of Mahadeva. First slide, please. A week or so later, after visiting the Mandir, I was sitting on the top of a long stone set of stairs, a shortcut through the steep paths, and I heard a loud, steady beat. Curious, I followed the monotonous drumming, which echoed through the small valley where I sat. I peered unobtrusively into the house I finally found to which the rhythms led. Seated on the floor in a wide circle sat two bombos and their young apprentice. The beat I heard vibrated from large drums, Diangro and Nepali, held upright by the shamans. Having come closer, I could hear the small brass bells called ganta in Tibetan, the size of plums clanging alongside the thump thumping drum beats. The bells were worn across the shoulders of the central bombo, and he shook his shoulders and upper chest with strong rotations to his body to coordinate the sounds. I quickly darted out, feeling I was intruding. It was my first glimpse into the world that would change my ideas of healing in the village and the surrounding area. Next slide. This paper will focus on the traditional healers I encountered in my doctoral research on chronic pain in a group of villages in rural Nepal. I'll look at the shamans known as the Bombos in the Tamang language, who also work closely with the villagers with chronic pain. For my research, I used a clinical ethnography methodology where I interacted using a biopsychosocial approach common in pain specialized physiotherapy in which I trained, the profession in which I worked in many, for many years, 
and informed with an anthropological framework. Next slide, please. This ethnography will center on the bombos as individuals, describing their understanding of how they gain and maintain their power to heal. I'll tie this into my observations of the social dynamics and the impact of their roles and obligations to their immediate family as heirs of a healing tradition in the Weiner community and how this contributed to their reputation as bombos, which, which impacted their ability to heal. Following Stacy Pig's article, The Social Symbolism of Healing in Nepal, summarizing Komarov, and I quote, it's important not only to take into account the social factors implicated in medical interactions, but also to consider how attention to the realm of healing can shed light on social concerns that are not strictly medical. The bombos were placed in a position of constant negotiation to maintain their reputations within the community and feel secure in that they were entrusted with their prominent roles. I aim to illustrate how this trust was their power as healers and how the villagers with chronic pain preferred the familiarity of their treatments over the biomedical clinic. I describe the outcomes of a healing ritual, a puja, with a villager called Pasang, which you see here in the slides, all names are pseudonyms, and how his trust in the bombo and the process allowed him to cope better with his persistent pain and mental anguish. He was not cured, as was not expected, but he was more active and functional, living a less isolated and more fulfilling life. Next slide, please. So Pasang's puja, or healing ritual, was aimed to, quote, unquote, scare the fright away, as they described it and was translated by my, by my research at, uh, assistant from Tama. Or the Bombo's practice of confronting a ghost who has taken away his hongsa, which is, um, it's the death state soul. So there's different, three different levels, levels of soul in their, um, in their tradition. Um, and what Pasang had referred to it as, is his mind. But then again, this is through a, a Tamang translator. So um, that might, in, in reading the literature, there were different references and different terms for this. Later that night of my first meeting described above, when I followed the drum beats, I returned to observe this healing drama displayed as a battle, as Nicoletti describes, between the bombos and the thieving ghost. Next slide, please. In this paper, however, I am not so much to detail the rituals as to recount the place that the bombos lived, held in the lives of the people with whom I worked. All of my participants sought the care of the bombos initially. Some were treated only by the traditional healers. Some sought biomedical care at the local Nam government hospital, then didn't return to the bombos, while both, some were treated simultaneously, much as Stacy Pig observed in the late 80s. The bombos were also eminent members of the community. Apart from their skills in he healing, they held authority. Their reputations were critical. Okay. Patsang told me he, he was changing, no longer had nightmares after this healing. He was a man in his 60s with whom I began working once to twice weekly during my duration of my stay in Nepal. He first came to me as a pain specialist physiotherapist, complaining of his widespread, widespread musculoskeletal pain. I saw a distinct change in his overall mood. He felt more motivated and was confident that his hunks I had returned to him. Additionally, Pasang described his pain as somewhat reduced. His face no longer pinched with every movement. He did describe that when his hongsa was gone, he felt like running in the jungle. He was highly anxious and fearful of other people and didn't feel like talking, only wanted to be alone, but that situation had changed. I understood this to result from his complete confidence in the bombo. However, he did admit that the first puja with a bombo called Karsang was not as effective, but it, he didn't seem to blame him so much for that. I didn't ask him why he felt this. It was evident that the second ritual met his needs. An older bombo performed it. He was called Meme or grandfather in Tamang, and he was Karsang's father. During one of my many visits to Karsang's house, house after the pujas, I eventually met Meme. He was amiable, however, imposing and commanded respect throughout and within the extended family. Was there a trust issue with Karsang and Pasang? Was he not considered reputable? So a second one was called in. I wasn't really sure. Only now do I realize this might have been the case. 
the issue of trust in the Bombos that was primarily built on the reputations became a central important theme in how I came to understand the efficacy of their healing. Next slide. I stood in the blazing sun in a sand, sandy, dry clearing across from the high school watching the Bombos, long streams of red, green, and white scarves spread with each fast twirl white linen skirts billowing like Sufis. Almost five weeks had passed since I attended the two pujas with the Bombos performing with uh, Pasang. The Bombos had made their first stop in the village which surrounded the small holy lake to chant, dance, and take up the offerings to Panchpokhari. It was our last starting point for the journey during the August Purnima or full moon in Sanskrit to travel to the five holy lakes of Mahadeva and receive his blessings. They would stop along the way to take the messages from the people to bring to the festival. And on the return trip, they would stop again, returning with the renewed power of Mahadeva. It was a five day round trip through the mountains. Next slide, please. Soon after returning from the pilgrimage, Karsang said he was eager to meet with me and discuss something involving his middle daughter. When we met, he was visibly worried. We sat on the floor in my house and as he left his tea to turn cold, he got straight to the point. He said he was honored that I sought him out again and I and knew that I respected him. He said he respected me in return as we both helped people to get well. Um, and I quote, my reputation is everything. People will not come to see me if they don't regard me highly. He then asked me to spend some time with his daughter as she had run into some trouble. Karsan continued to explain how he became a bombo and described how they developed their abilities. He said he underwent his initiate year when he was 18. Karsan didn't choose his life, he said, but a deceased bombo relative had chosen him. One of his father's relatives had died while harvesting honey high on a cliff, falling from the bamboo ladder erected to reach the hives. Karsan explained that the spirit of one of his three grandfather's sons was his inner guru, spiritual teacher in Sanskrit and guide, and spoke to him during the pujas. His guru instructed him in the rituals to find the ghost and how to challenge it, allowing the ill person to heal. He talked about some of his early experiences. For example, one day he said when he was 18, he was fixing a water buffalo's rope after working in an old house when he started to feel this electric shock type pain, which he described as sitting, sitting in Nepali, course through his body. He couldn't stop this feeling and his mother took him to their local bombo who started a ritual healing called Ngagba in Tamang on him. He too started to shake and it eventually stopped. The family realized at the time that Karsang would be a bombo. There was another type of bombo he said called Banjankri or forest bombo and they're not forced he said not through familiar lines as he described have been with him but they choose to live this life. They live they're invisible they live in the forest. And if they touch someone, he said that they would turn into a forest bombo as well. Karsan continued with his story about his initiate year. The next evening, the shock-like feeling returned and he felt something forcing him to revisit the house that he'd been working the day before. When he approached the door, the padlock suddenly opened on its own accord and he entered. He walked to where he saw a box sitting on a table, and despite the dark room, the content shone brightly like a light bulb through the locked box, Karsang said. The lid opened again on its own accord, and, Kars and Karsang took out an object, the gantamala, which is a string of bells that they, that they wear that we saw in the previous slide. For the next four months, Karsang began to shake, the, to control the shaking by accepting or, quote, um, cutting the chi, which he described as the impulse from the bombo relative, the guru. The guru could not eat or enter a higher realm without Karsang accepting his transference through this process. By accepting and listening to the guru's instructions in his dream, Karsang began to develop his own skills. His relationship with his relative thus provided him with the knowledge he needed to heal, what puja to conduct, and what mantras or prayers to say to what ghosts, each causing different conditions. He explained the different types of ghosts, who they were, when they were hungry, when they entered people, and all the different ailments to me. He performed the blowing ritual, the ngagba. He made a pact when he made a pact with the spirit of the ill person and promising that they would feed the ghosts more. 
it became clear how vital a role these negotiations played within the realms of the living and the deceased. Karsung was continually working his reputation as a bomb on his social standing in the community. His reputation cemented the trust of the people who sought his help. He didn't ask for payment, by the way. He also had to relent to the instructions of a deceased relative and his guru, keep the peace in his immediate family in the living realm of the humans, guide his children in the right direction, uphold the Bombo traditions and obligations under Meme, his Bombo father. Lastly, Karsang had to make promises to the hungry ghosts on behalf of those suffering with ailments. This continuum stretched from gentle persuasion to force across three planes of existence. The conversation came back to his concerns about his 15-year-old daughter, Sapina. For brevity's sake, she had contacted some people who promised to secure her a visa to travel to the Emirates. Instead, they intended to traffic her for sex work. Unfortunately, this dubious process happens frequently with the young people in the region. Carson explained that the young man had been identified and he planned to submit a case to the courts against him for attempted trafficking. Since this event, he'd sought advice on his own from senior bompos. They had said his daughter couldn't marry for at least a year once her name was cleared. He felt that this was impacting every aspect of his daily life, understandably. Carson worried that people wouldn't call him for pujas and that their trust in him was significantly impaired. He placed his hopes on the, on the court case's outcome to restore his daughter's reputation. The credibility of Sapina's story directly impacted his um, the status and reputation as a healer, his power in the community, and his actual power to heal as a bombo. Families in the village were seen as one unit without distinction necessarily between each individual. Once children usually married a partner of their parents' choosing, which is quite strategic for supporting family cohesion. This vignette regarding Kasang's daughter is intended to demonstrate this point. Moreover, Kasang's reputation as a bumbo was closely tied to the reputation of his children. When he said that Sapuna couldn't marry for a year, that told me that he'd wish for her to be married earlier and that he had someone in mind to solidify the bonds with another family, most likely one within the Bombo community. The, next, the life of most Bombos is inherited and not chosen, as I've said. This link creates a sense that the deceased relative is guru or teacher has never died. The obligations continue. The deceased come to the Bombo in their dreams, providing knowledge passed down to them for the preceding generations from the Bombo for their guru. At the start of the puja, the drumming and intentional shaking of the string of the bells are gone to worn across the shoulder induces a trance. During this phase, which can last for many hours, the bombo listen to their guru's instructions in an altered state. Familiar ties are reproduced and enhanced in this tradition. Arranging marriages for one's children to another bombo family continues this lineage. It's a way of life. Next slide, please. In December, I accompanied another group of Bombo from Karsang's village on a pilgrimage with him leading. He told me how he had all the 40 pilgrimages, pil pilgrims counting on him and that he was responsible for everyone. He was attentive to everyone, ensuring that they were warm enough, had enough food and it tended to the trip's logistics. He was dependable, but also anxious that things ran smoothly. This trip was before the outcome of his daughter's court case, and he was conscious that it might that he might be judged if there were in, incidents along the way or anything to fuel gossip. Next slide, please. Which is a video, actually, just so you can get a sense of of. Uh... <laughs> Right, okay, I've got three minutes, so I'm gonna speak very quickly. The Bombos rely on trust, trust that people will come to see them and access the knowledge of their ancestors have entrusted to them. Moreover, there is the issue of trust and the method of healing they provide. This paper argues that the process of seeking the help of the Bombos is the coping strategy of the villagers for chronic ailments. They don't know that they'll probably not get better, and will not be cured from the long-term back pain, for example. However, the steadfast reliability of the bombos and the familiarity with the mantras reassure the person in pain. The villagers view the bombos' family structure as an example, a good reputation for raising their own children within line with Tamang ways. 
The bombos are part of a Tamang tradition, which has endured generations and alive through the teachers. Next slide. In my interviews with the health clinic staff, the local population tends not to seek their care, as I'd mentioned, but instead visit the bombos. I asked the clinic staff how they treated patients with persistent pain, and I quote, we tell them their pain will go away, that they will get better if they take our medicine. I was curious why they would say that, knowing this wasn't the case with chronic pain. And I quote, we tell them this because we know they're under stress and we don't want to worsen that. Plus, if the pain goes away, they'll return and tell us we were wrong. Okay, next slide. <laughs> During Song's first puja with Karsong and second with Mei, Mei neither Bombo spoke directly to him nor looked into his eyes. There was no evidence of what we call rapport that we look for in, for good outcomes in um, biomedicine. Instead, there was attendance of the many villagers at the healing ritual, which provided support and validation. In conclusion, the healers see their power as supernatural directly from Mahadeva, but through their ancestral guru as a medium or conduit. I do, I do not contest the supernatural, but also seek to understand the social complexity. The Bombos also see the power to heal from the ethical and moral dimensions as seen as Karsang's family, and hence his reputation. Often power is understood as the efficacy of a ritual. In other words, did it work? Instead, I argue that it might be through this circle of negotiations on many levels. Firstly, on the spirit level with Mahadeva and the Bombos and the Bombos guru from another realm in their dreams and trance, but maintained through the waking life through their reputations. This power is reinforced through pilgrimages, following rules, and family relationships that further enact their trust as healers. Last Thank you. I did show it. That was it. Okay. It was they they were on the way. This is Pasang, by the way, after he's healed and he's walking to the village. Thank you. <laughs> um thank you, Paula. Uh next. We have uh, a paper by Eloise Tafaloni da Cunha from uh, Universidad de Barcelona uh, called uh, Healing Through Visual Trust, Modalities of Visualization in a Bolivian Therapeutic Ritual. Welcome. Very high on the ritual. Yeah. Here. No. No. Ah. <laughs> um, just to check, it would be a video after, where can I find mm -hmm. it here? I will go there and okay. okay. And to do the slide that will be saying. Yeah, I think yes, yes. Okay. Right. Yes, So good afternoon to everyone and thank you very much, uh, Emily, uh, to uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to share with you some thoughts about common concerns. And so I'm Eloisa Perina Cunha, and I'm actually a postdoctoral researcher and the ERC project Digital Trust, uh, led by uh, Roger Canals. And my task will be to uh, uh, analyze how images, uh, medical images are being used throughout the therapeutic uh, uh, journey. But today, I would like to reflect on the concept we have been working on with Wuji as part of the ERC project, the concept of healing through visual trust. And this afternoon, I would like to do, by, uh, to do so by focusing on the research I've been doing um, for the past 10 years now in Bolivia, uh, in a village called Santiago de Huari, which is uh, just there on the shore of uh, Lac Popo, uh, totally lost in the Altiplano. Here it is. So the, the visual ethnography I conduct as a part of the ERC project is more European because I, I work in hospital uh, in Spain and in France, but we aim for the framework we develop uh, in the ERC project to be useful for analyzing uh, visual uh, ethnographies and ethnographies by itself uh, from uh, other cultural areas, such as the one um, of my previous research in Bolivia. So over the next 20 minutes, uh, I would like to reflect on the therapeutic uh, ritual called the uh, Cabildo, uh, which is uh, led by a, a local healer called Luis. And I propose to study 
This ritual, by drawing on the notion of trust, understood as a situated event, an event in which uh, images play a key role in the process of healing patients. So to better understand the notion of trust as a situated okay. event, I propose to reflect on what is called the uh, multimodality of a therapeutic interaction from a pragmatic uh, perspective. That's mean that, uh, that means that I propose to consider the different channels, so the sensory channel, the gestural, uh, linguistic, artifactual channels used by the healer, Luis, uh, to create meaning in the interaction and ultimately trust. I propose to reflect on uh, this by considering the temporal dimension of the ritual. Uh, that means that I will think at the same time about the time the ritual uh, agencies, but also the different temporalities which have led to the ritual itself. And thus, uh, as we will see, this approach will lead me to go beyond the idea of uh, a unique situated event, as if the material forms of trust were confined to like a single event. So rather than trust as a, a unique situated event, uh, I would propose to approach uh, trust as a series of uh, multiple uh, micro events inscribed in very specific situations, situations that are themselves part of a wider context in which uh, cooperation network play a, a key role. And I will need to reflect on what, uh, I will still need to reflect on what images play uh, in this therapeutic framework and what kind of images are these. So the cabildo uh, led by Luis take place at night uh, in a dark room. It is supposed to cure people uh, suffering from diseases said to be caused by dreams. And these dreams uh, involve um, an encounter with uh, powerful entities. And these entities are said to live in specific places of the ALU, the ALU being the uh, minimal unit, territorial unit of social organization in the Andes. So I did this map, okay, <laughs> with what I had, uh, to show you a bit of how Wari actually is separated into like six different ILUs, and you have different uh, uh, places uh, in uh, in the light blue here. You will have, for instance, the uh, water sources. Uh, in uh, violet, you have places for funeral rituals. Anyway, all that, and uh, so this is another map uh, to show you actually how uh, many uh, places there are uh, in uh, the ALU, in each ALU. Just uh, to show, to, to say that these entities, um, they are ambivalent entities and they can make sometimes people sick by making them dream specific nightmares called mushpai. Um, and so when they wake up from these mushpai dreams, people like suffer uh, symptoms. Um, they also mention difficulty in their relationship with the family or with the neighbors or in like a professional context. And all this uh, led them to go and see Luis to do a cabildo. So during the cabildo, Luis, the healer, is said to go into trance. Uh, he says he's, uh, he's possessed by a saint, a saint called Tata Santiago. Uh, it is actually Tata Santiago who is said to lead the ritual by uh, speaking through Luis. It will make the entities come to the place of the ritual and uh, to punish them and to like, then make them release the animu of uh, the patients. The animu being one of the uh, substances of the person in the Andes, which is said to be uh, kidnapped by the uh, entities during the dream. So I will show you for a little bit an example of uh, what is a cabildo. I will go very quickly. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Volta sua anima e spirito, volta del Signore Dio, Padre Gesù, tu sei il suo cammino, 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 tu sei
Gloria a Dios, Espíritu, Espíritu Santo, 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 De la policía no se ha hecho la atropellada. ¿Es it going on now? For the no? Uh, wait, let, let it run. Aquí? Sí. 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 It's like a black screen, uh, so it's like the key stone, which is not important. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Right. Perfect. So again, <laughs> shall we start again or can yes. we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Su ánimo, Espíritu, va a decir Dios Padre Jesús, tu seas sostenimiento por tus hijos, San Espanso, San Diego de Gombores. Gloria a los Espíritus, tu seas sostenimiento por tus hijos, San Diego de San Diego de Gombores. Santo Bolo, Santa Número, trae los animitos, donde está su animito. Santo Bolo, Santa Número. Vaya, vaya, policemos, vaya, santeros, ni vaya, buenas noches. Vaya, tienen que llamar, que es el motivo de Chasnín. ¿Qué es tu nombre de usted? Ezequiel. ¿Ezequiel? Sí. ¿Tu esposa? Mary. Mary. Para Ezequiel, para Mary, para Santo Mendo, para curar, para Santo Mendo, 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 para Bastante <tose> I'm stopping here because it can last for an entire night. So, <laughs> that. Um, as you can see, uh, nothing is. Nine one zero one.
has to be visible. Um, <clears throat> but here we cannot see anything, and I couldn't each time I was participating in a care build, though, I knew neither. So, like the only thing you can see is a black screen. Um, However, the, the patients and their families were all the time telling me after the cabildo that during the ritual, they had like a lot of images flashing before their eyes. And these images were always the same, uh, images of places where the entities are said to live or images of the uh, entities itself. So what role uh, this uh, form of vision plays uh, in healing the patient? So my uh, previous research, Okay. Uh, um, actually, uh, I've shown that uh, that during a cabildo, uh, Luis is doing everything to make his uh, patients make their own images. Uh, that means uh, that to make the patients visualize uh, the entities who are normally uh, invisible. Uh, Luis is using uh, for that a lack of seeing, uh, the fact that the room is actually dark, and different techniques the multimodal uh, channels have uh, mentioned before. Like for instance, you heard it when he eats the table with one of these objects uh, to make sound like the entities is arriving on the, the entity are arriving on this on site. So I have called these different multimodal techniques regimes of visibility or making visible because in French we say uh, regime de mise en visibilité. So, and uh, uh, do so because uh, these regimes, I call them like this, because this regime actually uh, give the patient access to another form of vision. Uh, it is only because nothing is visible to the uh, physiological eye that the invisible can be seen. So what I would like to uh, discuss now is the idea that Luis does everything for his patient to have an experience of visualization that occurs in the body uh, that underpins the uh, gradual process of building compliance and trust uh, to the treatment he offers, uh, which is a cabildo. So the patients of Luis uh, never meet him by chance. Uh, uh, taking part in a cabildo actually is the end of a very long process, which involves a, a lot of uh, players, a collaboration network uh, that may at first uh, seem very contradictory because it's actually quite common for the patients of Louis uh, to have been in contact with the uh, hospital staff. And the two types of medicine, the allopathic and the non-conventional, uh, are actually not seen as opposite. The, the people of Rari, they use them differently depending on their needs and situation and the context at the time. So for instance, some of the patients of Louis uh, were undergoing treatment with medication and vaccination. Uh, other have sometimes uh, uh, I've been recommended by uh, the uh, medical staff to go and see a healer, and so even though there there are tensions and conflicts, as you really well said in your presentation, between the two uh, health systems, there is a porosity uh, between them, and this porosity has been facilitated by a, a public initiative from the government of the former president Evo Morales, and for instance, there is a, a program called the CFC program which has been created 10 years ago uh, to implement uh, into hospital uh, consultation rooms for local healers. So it's not always successful, but sometimes it works. All that to say that uh, even though the therapeutic journey of the patients may vary depending on the sociological profiles and the biographical journeys, uh, we can find a fairly similar uh, configuration when uh, it comes to studying their uh, curative uh, uh, journey over time. So before arriving at Louis, patients have already uh, seen medical uh, staff or other curanderos or both. And so they arrive at least several months, or sometimes several years after they have begun the treatment to cure their symptoms. And so Louis is often seen as their last chance. So arriving at Louis requires from the patients a lot of personal commitment uh, to heal. Let's say you cannot go on Google and try to find Luis. Huh? So the patient have to actually um, really actively mobilize uh, uh, their network and ask for recommendations. And then the patients uh, have to classify and evaluate the recommendations they received. And they do so uh, by how they trust the person they received the recommendation from. And by trust, I mean the quality at the time of the request of the relationship they have with the person they choose within the uh, cooperation network. Then uh, there are several stages uh, for the patient to go through before the cabildo, and all these stages are micro-situated events. 
for instance, the first consultation with Luis, uh, which is always a divination with coca leaves. Uh, and this divination actually will help uh, uh, Luis to formulate uh, a diagnosis and offer a treatment, in this case, a Gabildo. The patient then goes home and uh, discuss it with the members of the cooperation network. Uh, and so this is uh, an act of collective discussion. Um, it is very important because it is during this act that uh, people will decide if they agree or not uh, with the diagnostic. And uh, so trust here is a collective process. Also because uh, to go uh, to uh, a cabildo is a collective commitment. It's uh, always, and most of the time is held as a family member. So people have to come, people who live abroad or in different city have to come to worry, to participate into the cabildo. Also, it costs a lot of money, uh, like 150 euros. Sometimes it's like half of the monthly salary of the uh, patients. So everybody has to participate financially. Uh, also, they uh, have to, sorry. Sometimes they have to go to another city to buy artifacts, which got also a lot of money. Uh, so all these micro events actually experience that the patient put him in a special frame of mind, uh, shaping an environment, uh, supporting compliance to the treatment. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So when everybody is uh, in worry and all the artifacts have been uh, booked, the patient and the family then take part in a, a cabildo, and uh, a cabildo which always starts with a second divination uh, by itself. So at this stage, uh, the emotional, personal, psychological, and financial investment is such that the patient is desperate uh, for the ritual to work. And nevertheless, uh, the patients I spoke to, um, uh, they told me like before the ritual, like just a few minutes before it, it starts, that they still have doubts, apprehensions, and fears. But on the other end, after the cabildo, uh, they always tell me that, um, that they are really confident and reassured about the future. So something happened during the cabildo, um, and that something is the image making process uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk on the visualization, visualization experience the patients live during the, the cabildo. I have to add at this stage uh, of my presentation that the images the patients see during the cabildo are drawn on the images they have seen during their nightmares, the mushpai dreams, because my previous research uh, actually showed that there is a strong correspondence between the pathogenic dream images and the therapeutic images uh, seen during the ritual. But there is one uh, major difference. These images are experienced in a different way uh, thanks to the relational context uh, within which these images are being seen. This relational context being the whole process that lead to the ritual shaped by a theory, a series of uh, micro situated events I spoke about. So to put it in another way, uh, when they dream, uh, the dreamer uh, sees images uh, that make him or her so afraid that she or he wakes up sick and has to go to the doctor. On the other hand, during the cabildo, because the patient is surrounded by family, sometimes friends, uh, is also fiercely protected by uh, Luis and Tata Santiago, who are said to be like very powerful. Um, all this makes that, uh, uh, and also there is this um, uh, the long therapeutic journey I detailed, uh, which uh, 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 makes sure that the patient is slowly uh, but uh, surely uh, uh, building a strong sense of commitment to, to the ritual. And so by, by visualizing uh, these images in this specific context, with this specific frame of, of mind, uh, patients can experience in a different way uh, their relationship with the entities, which make them sometimes sick. So, so they are not afraid anymore. And actually, it's not uncommon to hear patients like getting very angry with the entity, screaming at them, insulting them, something that they will never do uh, normally. So to conclude, uh, the context in which uh, an, image, uh, an image is seen uh, transform the effects uh, they can have. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, there is this, actually, I think it's uh, an idea I, I will have to uh, <laughs> highlight. It's like what, what happens during the cabildo is an experience of visualization uh, during which images are not mere representations, but have real effects. Uh, uh, the images seen during uh, the cabildo are therapeutic uh, and they are performative images 
and their performativity uh, was made possible by setting up a, a specific visualization context, uh, a context uh, which has been shaped by acts of trust uh, that took different forms uh, throughout their healing journey. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. Uh, and now our last paper of the session. Where is she? Oh, there. <laughs> You're sitting over there. Uh, Elena Fuzapoli. Um, Elena Fuzapoli is from the um, Universidad de Milano. And her paper today is entitled The House of Steam in Abia, Isla, and in Europe during pandemic and post-pandemic times, a two-way therapeutic pluralism. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. And yes, uh, my name is Elena Fusarpoli, and uh, my contribution um, is rooted in my PhD fieldwork. Uh, I just concluded my PhD uh, with a thesis uh, dedicated to the uh, social effects of uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, among uh, um, indigenous and not only, not indigenous communities uh, in uh, Oaxaca state uh, in Mexico, um, where I conducted uh, a nine month of ethnography. Uh, so of course we don't have time to explore all the implication of COVID-19 there, uh, but uh, I would like to highlight how um, traditional or indigenous uh, medicine has been the uh, central element of a more general communitarian regeneration during a pandemic and post-pandemic time. Um, when COVID-19 erupted in Wakaka, thousands of uh, young and not so young uh, people were uh, compelled to return uh, back to their rural villages uh, uh, from uh, the major cities uh, uh, in the US, for example, Los Angeles, or uh, in the northern Mexico, for example, of course, Ciudad de Mexico, uh, where they had migrated uh, in order to look for a, a job or educational opportunities. Um, in, this, in this time, in that time, uh, the local environment uh, um, was seen as a salvation, uh, contrasting it with the danger uh, of viral transmission and hunger experienced uh, in those larger cities. Um, the lifestyle of the village and uh, of communities more in general uh, was viewed uh, uh, with new eyes and um, was appreciated as the only means to survive, for example. And uh, in this survival, a great, a great, a great role uh, has been the one of the traditional medicine. Um, first of all, a premise, in Wakaka, healing is conceived uh, uh, holistically. Uh, healing uh, is healing from uh, COVID-19 and uh, more general from uh, human illness, but uh, uh, also healing meet, uh, means uh, um, to heal the rupture affecting the relationship between uh, human and nature, uh, considered the uh, true cause of the uh, current global pandemic more than the virus itself. Um, okay. Um, in this process, which uh, uh, an Uruguayan sociologist Raul Zibeki called the uh, uh, inward turn, indigenous communities and uh, uh, rural villages developed a range of strategies to address COVID-19 uh, based on their own resources and their own uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, also due to the deficiency in public health and welfare system of the Mexican state. Um, for both practical and uh, symbolic reasons, all the territories in Wakaka witnessed a resurgence of indigenous political and cultural movements, um, practices that were on the verge of disappearing uh, were rediscovered in various aspects of uh, village life and especially in the field of uh, healthcare. Um, respected traditional healers were uh, called uh, in the in the different villages and in the different uh, healthcare center to assist the sick and also to impart their methods to the people. Uh, but also other individuals returning to their community began using traditional medicine and uh, practice its methods, even if they lacked prior experiences. 
uh, but maybe they are people that study the indigenous culture in the university, for example, or uh, reading, uh, simple reading and uh, combining elements uh, from different indigenous tradition for the, from the different uh, Mexican pueblos, but also uh, more general indigenous tradition uh, uh, all, uh, coming from all over the world. And while people often refer to local medicine as traditional, uh, the field of healing underwent months of research of transformation to adapt to the new situation and to its new uh, protagonist. A key concept to understand what several anthropologists have called medical pluralism, or uh, I prefer their a pragmatic approach to the two medicines, it's, it's trust, of course. Um, and I want to spend few words about the particular context of Americas, uh, where there exists a, a concept of power imbalance due to colonialism, neocolonialism, and the complex relationship between the state and communities. Over the past five centuries, trust has been shaped by a fluid interplay of centripetal and centrifugal forces. With centrifugal forces, I mean all the forces that direct people's trust outside their communities, proposing a modernization ideal based on Western medical science and uh, biomedical hospital. As numerous anthropologists and philosophers who have studied the colonial regimes has noted, uh, yesterday we talked about that, uh, these kinds of modernization ideals are often embodied by people who begin to perceive the, their own traditional lifestyle as uh, archaic, as primitive, and attempt to emancipate themselves by adopting external standards. With centripetal force, I mean all the forces that reinforce people's trust and pride in a way of life perceived as proper, proper and traditional. In the South of American context, these kinds of forces are particularly strong when external threats endanger individual and communal survival. Particularly, uh, COVID-19 has been conceived as a result of a Western lifestyle and an attack of indigenous lifestyle. Um, the lack of a public health system capable of helping the most vulnerable people as the indigenous one and the rural villages one during pandemic has been another important reason to reinforce trust in uh, traditional healing practices considered always available. As a healer of uh, uh, from a small village told me, uh, we don't know if the vaccine will arrive, but we know that we have plans. If the vaccine arrives, ojalá, hopefully, it will be efficient. But uh, we are sure that plants are efficient because our abuelas, no? our grandmother in a longer sense, uh, used them. So um, the most important understanding is that uh, even though the specific historical moments make, uh, may make centrifugal or centripetal forces predominant over the other, in Latin American context, they are always combined. And I, think, I find particularly interesting that the pandemic has promoted centripetal forces in a not European context like the rural Mexico, strengthening trust in traditional medicine at the point that a great number of people and communities decide to rediscover and overall to reinventing this tradition. But on the other hand, the pandemic has triggered centrifugal forces in Western naturalistic knowledge, uh, where conspiracy theories and scientific skepticism are growing. And uh, there is a growing search for alternative well-being practices. So a, a, double, a double sense. A movement. Um, I will try to analyze this two-way path of healing, pluralism in pandemic and post-pandemic period through the case study of the House of Steam, or uh, uh, as people say in Mexico due to Nahuatl languages, the Temazcal. Um, Temazcal is a ritualistic sauna designed to um, expel physical and emotional toxins. Physically, the sauna induces sweating, uh, cleansing the skin and the entire body. Inhaling of medicinal plants dispersed by the steam um, proves beneficial for their health properties. During COVID-19, particularly, uh, healers use eucalyptus and uh, other plants specifically for uh, uh, respiratory issues. 
in addiction, Temascal um, is included in a, a local medical conception which divided illness, but also therapies, plants, uh, substances, emotion uh, in a binary opposition between hot and cold. And uh, Temascal is hot and it's uh, exactly what uh, sick lungs uh, need. Emotionally, more important for us today, emotionally, the Temascal creates a unique state uh, with uh, elevated heat, total darkness, uh, reduction in oxygen, uh, ritualistic statement and ritualistic song, repetitive songs. Uh, while there is no established literature connecting Temascal experience to trans states in the history, the alteration in uh, normal perception and uh, search for a special connection with not human elements, both natural and spiritual, creates an experience uh, akin to a trans state especially during the longest and more intensive Temascal session. Uh, just to give an idea, to provide an idea, uh, the longest session I experienced um, lasted for uh, six hours, more or less, and it, it could, they, they could last more and more. Um, so you can imagine. Um, particularly, the new indigenous Temascal I encountered in Wakaka in 2021 explicitly aimed to create an alternative dimension of time, of space, and of emotion. Temascal structure can be constructed using uh, stones, woods, and other materials, but uh, it always symbolizes the womb of the heart. Entering in the Temascals signifies regeneration and rebirth from the heart, so it symbolizes a transition in life status. Um, this form of feeling involves healing through the heart and with the nature, striving for a new balance between the self and the other, humans and not human entities, including plants, animals, and also ancestral spirits. The unique Temascal environment invoke a radical dissociation from the outside world, representing an heterotopia with its own rules. In particular, the profound darkness and the suspension of time punctuated only by the breath, no? the alterated breathing, create uh, what the French philosopher Merleau-Ponty called a pre-objective world. Um, established alternative norms for perception and interaction within this heterotopia, uh, resulting in a particular intersubjective production of meaning. During the longer session, perception is subjected to extreme condition. For instance, during Temascal session in San Pablo Huizzo, the small village where I feel working, um, a young woman recounted feeling the touch of the person to whom she was uh, directing her intention or uh, her intensive talks. On one occasion, a woman in a Temascal shared that uh, uh, while the healer was singing, and it was a repetitive chant accompanied by a drum, um, the voice of another person, her mother, gradually emerged from within, in her word, the healer's voice. This voice spoke to her in um, her native Mazatec language, which this girl only vaguely understood, but it brought her intensely back to uh, her very early years, to the point that uh, when the door of the Temascal uh, opened, she seriously thought uh, she would find her mother at the entrance. The control of breath um, is one of the main important uh, aspect of the Temascal, and uh, it was uh, particularly emphasized uh, during the COVID-19 because uh, um, being aware of this fundamental vital function helped to manage uh, um, cases of uh, lung disease. Um, the extreme attention placed on breathing when uh, the heat increases significantly and the uh, oxygen decreases due to buildup of carbon <laughs> dioxide in a small closed space, uh, produce on one hand a sort of individual metronome focused on one's own very slow and uh, prolonged inhalation and exhalation. Um, on the other hand, uh, it brings a focus of attention inward 
inside the hood in a double movement of centering that promotes a state that, in my opinion, people looks like very similar to a trans condition. I witnessed this uh, in an elderly man who caused concern when, during his turn in one of the rounds of speech proposed by the healer to the participant, he did not respond at all, not even when touched by those nearby. When the healer wet him with cold water, he began to interact with those present again and only say that he was feeling very good in there, breathing without feeling fair. We could discuss several other examples, but of course we don't have enough time, but this, this is to give you an idea, to provide an idea. But I, what I want to highlight is the importance of the Temascal uh, in the um, contemporary inward and neo-indigenistic turn triggered by the pandemic, because it has been perceived as the main holistic healing tool. It has helped counter uh, both the fear of contagions and the emotional consequence of illness and uh, death. It also aided in cleaning and caring for the lung stroke, the eucalyptus vaporization and other plants chosen for the occasion, instil instilling the confidence in the ability to face health uh, emergency. It's fascinating for me that the Temascal also exemplifies the parallelism of a healthcare system involving biomedicine and traditional, called so-called traditional medicine uh, in the Americas, and particularly in my case in Mexico, uh, from the Spanish invasion to the present day. Over the past centuries, and here, yes, there is a big literature, the Temascal, like other traditional practices, underwent transformation due to the contact with the European world, which in turn has been transformed, embraced its hygienic and therapeutic aspects, even if setting aside the most ritual aspects. In my personal field, field experience, I participated uh, in an experimental project that combined the psychologies and the functional structure of the Temascal ritual to promote mental health in rural communities of Wakaka through the psychotherapeutic groups. Referring to the so-called traditional Temascal has been really useful in this project to overcome a great stigma that affects the mental health problem in this area. Uh, the project was proposed by a local NGO um, with the aim to address uh, the emotional consequences of COVID-19, especially in terms of fear. In the village where I was carrying on my fieldwork, uh, the proposal has been accepted by the traditional uh, healing clinic, has the possibility to use a new therapeutic tool that maybe works with the same practical approach as we talked before. The house team has always been a bridge between cultures. In the last centuries, uh, several anthropologists uh, focused on uh, diffusionistic theory regarding the origin and the presence of house of steams, uh, of course, with, with uh, geographical particularity in the Americas, in the Europe, in Asia. And uh, in the recent year, uh, there has been a critical observation of the growing interest of new age and alternative spirituality group in the practices of uh, House of Steam. I believe that the pandemic has stimulated the exploration of alternatives in Europe and in the Western country more in general, um, especially in the field of medicine. And uh, I was very <laughs> surprised to find Italian people practicing Temascal in Friuli Venezia Giulia when I returned uh, from Wakaka to Italy. The case study is uh, one of several Italian informal well-being groups where people come together to experience alternative lifestyle and find a communal dimension based on a general skepticism about, uh, um, thank you, uh, about medicine, Western medicine, Western politics. This group, particularly this group I met, uh, was created by a yoga teacher uh, who used uh, her Instagram contacts to organize online and in-person meetings. These meetings are dedicated um, to spirituality, meditation, and alternative healings. Sometimes the group invites specialists like Hermano Ichu, a Peruvian healer with an Instagram channel. 
Erbano Ichu proposed to the group 10 days of indigenous and neo-indigenous well-being practices, and the group experienced in this occasion the Temascal or the house of steam, because in Peru it's not called Temascal. I interviewed many people in this group, and while they are all different, they share a common experience of sickness, of previous sickness, um, either themselves or their relatives, for which biomedicine has not provided a solution. In summary, they are all in search of any necessary means to avoid uh, suffering and to be well. Um, oh, yes, of course. Uh, yes. Um, uh, all the participants um, more or less report the same experience I had in Mexico. So this, the, the functional structure was more or less the same. The only different aspect reported is uh, an aesthetic dance in the world of uh, Hermano Ichu around the circle of hot stone at the end of the ceremony, something that I never uh, experienced before. Um, one of the most recurrent elements in these interviews is the benefit received from the drastic separation between uh, the outside and inside world uh, in the in the house of steam people never use expression trance but they variously refer that they feel themselves in other dimension never experienced it before some someone mentions that hermano ichu and other participants change their voice completely inside the house of steam as if they undergo a moment of reconnection in their world um almost everyone i interviewed emphasize the role of darkness and health and sources of profound stimulation. Um, I feel completely stimulated by darkness and health. I had physical and emotional perception totally different from my daily experience, emotion, expression, and relationship. Sarah Wegor explains that the second time she was there, her demons were there. Uh, they were with her in the Temascal and uh, she started experiencing a strong age. Uh, she had to go out and vomit. And she said, when I come back, I understood that demons had gone away. There were my comrades again. Uh, Paul, Paula talked about lucid dreams and, uh, and so on. A girl decided never come back in the house of steam because uh, she said, I don't want to go in anymore. I'm afraid not to come back. No, these, are, these, these are the expressions that participants use. In conclusion, I don't know if we can technically talk about trans in the Temascal, in the House of Steam, in Mexico or in Italy, but I still believe that in both situations, people are looking for an holistic and communal healing experience that transcends the normal boundaries of daily experience, emotions, expressions, and relationships. I cannot affirm with clarity whether people experience a proper trans state, but what matters to me and that one I wanted to suggest is that people want to stay in contact with natural and spiritual forces through the practice of House of Steam. Paradoxically, is an act of uh, agency, as someone notes yesterday. Uh, the majority of participants I interviewed uh, in Mexico and, and uh, in Italy reported that they felt better, purified, and transformed after the House of Steam experience an experience that they all perceived as a journey back to a primordial condition and return to the world. So for me, the question is, uh, in the post-pandemic era, how can anthropology promote a therapeutic pluralism based on trust and respect, prevent commercialization and excessive power imbalance and abuse there and here, and address the growing need for healing? How can medical practices like Temascal subvert the everyday pathological and painful experiences, transcending the local dimension in the complex mechanism of incorporation, transformation, and regeneration? I think that studying ethnographically practices as the House of Steam in their renewal and trust cultural processes could be very useful to make anthropology part of the healing processes of uh, our communities, as many anthropologists uh, hope. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, uh, for leaving with us with such uh, large, important yes. questions. <laughs> uh, do we have time for at least one round of... Uh, com okay, so I'd like to invite back Paula and uh, uh, Eloisa 
to the table so we can take questions um, from the audience here or from the audience online. Uh, you, you're online, right? You let us know if there's anything from line. Please. How about if I switch place with you so you're not behind the computer? You got to start, not me. So, um, Emily is also suggesting that if people have questions or want to talk about the papers from the last session, we can do a, a kind of round together with everyone here. Um, I'm behind here, so if anybody. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Uh huh. So, if uh, um anybody here or uh, online have any questions, I actually, if I can start where people are thinking, I have uh, very small questions. In in fact, and um, I was uh, listening to you, Paula, and uh, looking at your photographs, and that's something you didn't talk about. You showed us your photographs, and they are for lack of a better word, they're very beautiful. They're very powerful, invocative images. And you talked about this building of reputation and trust and, and, and how that's played on the efficacy. And I was wondering if you could, if there is anything, or if you could comment, I'm just tripping with your image, um, uh, about the aesthetic part of the ritual. You know, if there's anything in there, if you could comment. And that kind of going the other way uh, towards what uh, Louisa presented to us, um, you spoke about um, the performativity of images, but then when we saw, as you said, we saw darkness, but we heard, you know, so I was wondering if you could speak of the role of the role of the soundscape in that, in that, in that play uh, of, uh, of with image or, and uh, for uh, uh, Elena, it's, um, I actually, it's not a, quite a question, a question, but a commentary, because when you started and you start talking about indigenous people or Mexican folks returning to Mexico during the pandemic, it made me think of something that was told to me by uh, Daniel Chimochi, who is a Guarani indigenous anthropologist. And he spoke of um, during the pandemic, um, the indigenous community in Brazil locked themselves up. Uh, despite, I mean, despite the government, they locked themselves up. And then he talked about, uh, a different kind of temporality, you know, because people were focusing on the emergency of the pandemic. And he said he goes back and he kind of talks with the elders about a much longer temporal temporality of pandemic, like he says, 500 years of it. And then he also talks about this kind of um, um, not really return, but recuperation of the past, of how the past pandemics were dealt with by indigenous people and how they survived them. So it's a very different perspective on healing and and, and community and healthcare. So I, I don't know if that rings any bell for you, but those are just what I was thinking. Maybe we can take a round of questions if people have other questions. And my question for you was uh, how uh, you were able to know such a very how um, are you going uh, to, which days are you going to stay in the class? That was on the books, or oh, this after they do it. So then we will talk to you, they will be happy to work with the world about uh, Maya and uh, the shamanism, and she showed that the engagement of the, the patients we live during the shamanism, because the story is not collaborated, then it starts from the action. You can also see how they. The practice is the same. So my, my question to you was, what would be the same if they don't want to do a place for the class? Something that you can still have today, uh, I think, among the many initials. So uh, apart from this, from what we can already go to, we can be able to trust the, the time, see what's going to happen more than before. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is there any more? I forgot. Sorry, I have to apologize for the people who are online. I forgot to ask you to come and speak on the microphone. They couldn't hear your question. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that one. But is there any more question from? Yeah, can you come over here, please? And then we do a round of questions. Then we do the answer on the same order that the papers are presented. Could you go that way? Um, I wanted to ask you, but also other people, uh, because we were talking about trust uh, between patients and uh, healers, and we're talking about collaboration between different healers before. So I wanted to ask about the trust that people have in the spirits, in the possessing entities or in all kind of supernatural thing. I, I can say that in Korea, they can be wild, but they never kill people. Like they will never say the spirit killed the person. So I'm always thinking, where's the limit of what people trust or will they stop trusting them? Or Because when you let uh, spirits come in, you have to trust the spirit, right? Is somebody keeping track of the question because I'm going to forget. Yeah, <laughs> the answers. Just quickly, and if there is time, I just want to know more about Omni. Everything was very interesting, but uh, I was very uh, interested to know more about uh, the, the research you, uh, you participated in. And so what actually was, and in which way psychotherapy was used in the process. So you just touched on that. It was like, okay, that's so interesting. So telling us more about what was about, do we have fundings? And also for you, like, you know, uh, the participation, like being doing this as a participant in uh, the the, the therapeutic process, the, your your experience around that. Thank you. Well, um, I'll give the word back to the uh, table. Then start with Paula. Single the cell. Again, I I feel like I might forget some of the. Yeah, we should have written them down. I just wanted to make a comment regarding um, trust in in the spirit. Um, I remember asking um, Karsang, the, um, my interlocutor, the Bombo, are you ever afraid? Um, so there, of course, the, uh, the conduit, the, the ancestor is coming down and instructing them. And that's right. And that isn't really anything that I brought up or maybe wasn't so much the focus. He had complete trust because it was an ancestor who essentially nourished him from his his novice training and was with him in his dreams every night so so there was this this real sense of mentorship and um so i i i thought that maybe he would have maybe he didn't want to admit to being afraid from the beginning but um i felt that was quite strong thanks i don't know if anyone else wanted to address that one about about trust with the spirit um, actually, uh, in where I used to work, uh, spirit can kill people. Um, they can. Uh, there are some said. Uh, some are said to have like kidnapped people and use them and kill them. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 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 They can kill people. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, they, they are, they are in, I was going to say there are people you can trust and other you cannot, but they are entities that you can, uh, trust because, um, you can trust in a certain part of time, like in a specific, uh, period, like for example, during, uh, from January to March, you cannot really trust, uh, because it's like, a, it's a time during which some things are happening and again in August. August is a very uh, difficult time uh, of the year and you cannot really trust what you see also uh, and how you see things. Uh, during September, it's okay. Uh, November, we're starting again to have this porosity between different worlds, like the world where like the spirit lives, which is like the Ukupacha uh, of Virginia Pachamama. Um, so it, it is again, it depends on context and situation, how trust is being experienced by people, you know, towards uh, entities. That's how it works, uh, actually. I mean, what I've observed uh, on my field, in my field. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you... I asked you about some state. 
and songscapes. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, what happens during the cabildo is like it's a, a, a song. I mean, sounds uh, in plural that uh, make people see. Uh, it's a visual sound, right? Um, in other rituals that Louis uh, perform uh, performs, uh, you can see things during the day. So sounds is, is used in a different manner, um, but here specifically, of course, uh, there is a, a, a relief. I'm um, not in English, but uh, there is a soundscape, of course. And I should have add. Uh, I don't have the time, but actually. Uh, um, I don't really use the the word landscape because it also it comes from a very specific tradition, um, a Western one, and it implies that there is a distance between the environment and the the people. And uh, in the Andes, uh, when you try to think about the self, uh, you have to go beyond that idea of uh, distance, you know, between the environment and and someone. So it's 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 a song territory that is being experienced through uh, uh, different techniques during the ritual. Um, and then we can also speak about linguistic uh, uh, method because like if I was in Quechua, here I think it was in Spanish, but uh, when he does it in Quechua, he always use a very specific uh, uh, suffix because Quechua is a, it's a language which works with suffix. And so there's two suffix suffixes like mu and pu, and these suffixes actually are, are being used to um, in daily life also, but specific really like during a ritual to create a specific space because mu and pu are uh, suffixes which uh, indicates that uh, somebody is coming and somebody is leaving. So there is this idea of uh, going back and forth, and and so it creates a specific place, a specific space where healing can happen, right? Mm -hmm. So songs also is performative, you know, as as image. And actually, I we do audiovisual work, so it's like always songs and image combined. Um, and again, like if we go to we speak about cinema, um, a lot of directors I have uh, used like out of frame uh, sounds to make uh, the viewers uh, imagine what's going on in, in during the movie. You know, so it's a very old uh, techniques. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, for th your suggestion, um, after the fieldwork, uh, I use a lot of energy to try to compare my fieldwork results with uh, the results of others, anthropologists uh, um, that was working uh, uh, or has been working in um, different countries of uh, uh, Latin America and first of all Brazil and um, I think that there are a lot of differences but the differences are more in the specific relationship between uh, communities and the state mm -hmm. of course it's really different uh, or, um, the relationship between uh, indigenous communities and uh, uh, left side wing uh, uh, indigenous indigenous uh, part I as uh, the one in Mexico or uh, uh, the one with Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, of course, is really different. So um, also um, the, the, the value of the answers of communities is totally different. For example, in Mexico, they try not to count too much uh, death because they want to highlight how communitarian res uh, answer to COVID work, while in Brazil, community count uh, each, every single case and maybe more, but but every single case because they want to uh, highlight how uh, Brazilian government uh, um, are were uh, getting them totally alone. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, the, the, the most important similarities are um, exactly in uh, this uh, um, inward movement and in, in this, uh, uh, this decision to recuperate. But I want to stress this concept uh, also reinventing uh, something that they call tradition, but of course uh, it's something that is uh, uh, really, really a transformation of the idea of tradition. And uh, uh, talking about spirits, uh, uh, also in uh, in the rural area of Wakaka, there are a lot of spirits, uh, and there are also illness that came from uh, the loss of uh, his proper spirit. Um, but in this case, in the case uh, we are talking about the about the Temascal, uh, the spirits uh, to which I refer are 
good spirits because they are their ancestral spirits uh, the ancestral spirits uh, of the earth for mm-hmm. example each time that uh, um, hot stone uh, is uh, come come in the temascal everybody say hello to her say uh, with a ritual formula that uh, is uh, uh, welcome uh, grandmother grandmother stone or something like this and uh, all these kind of rituals are organized exactly to reduce the distance between humanity and nature so um, ancestral spirits are positive and uh, they invoke uh, a lot of times is proper ancestral grandfather grandmother but in an extensive sense um, in order to um, to see with more clarity what's happened today thanks to their experience so it's an invocation to the a, a mem- a, a, a collective memory through the, this kind of ancestral spirits, in my opinion. And last, um, about this uh, experience of uh, um, of a therapeutic group, a psychotherapeutic group, um, I was field working in uh, San Pablo Huizzo, that is a small village close to the main capital, Wakaka. And um, when uh, this local NGO proposed this project, uh, not only in Witso, but also in other villages, but Horizon proposed this project to the local clinics. I was uh, already working with this uh, uh, t- traditional medicine clinic uh, in- to do my field work. And when they arrived, they proposed the project because uh, uh, fear is really important element uh, in uh, in Mexico because fear is considered a pathological element uh, itself more than virus. And um, they want to address the emotional consequence of long COVID, something really important because here nobody cares about long COVID, but I think that is something that we can take. And um, when they arrived, the medical clinic say yes, but um, at, since the beginning it starts problems because there is a big stigma on um, mental health in, in the rural Mexico in general. And so when they start calling it a psychologist group, uh, nobody came, come. And so they asked me, okay, you are anthropologist, you are here, you know the territories, how we can do? Okay, maybe we can call it uh, Cuidado Mutuo project. Cuidado Mutuo means uh, mutual aid, uh, mutual aid, uh, because in uh, indigenous communities of Wakaka is really strong, this idea of mutual aid uh re- really strong it's something really deeply in the culture of community of wakaka in an economical and in a social uh, uh, means and okay the, the, the old longer than this but to some uh after the first uh, the first session were really cold uh, people refused to open itself uh, uh with the traditional uh, system of uh, psychotherapy and so we tried to to, to say, okay, but why if we use something from the Temascal, for example, we, ta- we take a, a ritualistic formula, really, really um, well known on the territories. For example, what you say here, aquí se queda, aquí se quema, uh, here remain and here burns. Uh, um, it represents something really holy. It's a pact, it's an only pact among people, or also the the turn of words, uh, or um, uh, four or five, uh, now is really long, but uh, uh, all the mechanism of the mascal, the well-known mechanism of the mascal, will take and put in the circle of therapy. And it has been really useful in order to make people open, to make people trust in uh, psychotherapy. Uh, in this particular moment of uh, growing trust in uh, what they think is traditional medicine, mm. more or less. Thank you. Alessandro. We have a question from the audience here. Okay. I had a question for Elena because she talked about uh, uh, a practice, a steam bath in Mexico, which is very widespread in northern in the northern hemisphere, but uh, which in North America and Mexico has had a very long history through millennia. And what I found fa- fascinating in her uh, speech was that in her talk was that the let's call it neoagization 
the new age perspective on the Temascal implies a sort of re-enchantment of it. Uh, I have witnessed the traditional ways in native communities where it is vanishing and where as far as they remind it or enact it, it has some specifically, let's say, bodily effects. It does not imply in, uh, strong uh, mythological or mystical uh, implications of interaction with uh, superhuman beings and so on. Once upon a time, it was supposed to be uh, supervised by the, go the Aztec goddess of childbirth. But nowadays, the communities where I saw it or heard about it think that its effect is mostly something that has to, de to do with the balance, the termic, symbolically termic balance of the body. Um, a, a question of heat and, and cold. And instead, in the revival that Temascal is experiencing all over Mexico, and as we have seen also in Europe, in Friuli Venezia Giulia, it is a revival that implies a strong emotional impact on the, on the members of the group. It has a much more social effect, and it can have very different uh, how to say, meanings that are attributed to it. It also can, can have a pan-Indian, uh, how to say, uh, trademark. If we can have a, a, a Peruvian specialist doing Temascal, Temascal is a very specific uh, Mesoamerican practice. It has nothing to do with Peru. It Steam baths are spread in the Americas, but they're not called this way. I remember that a student of mine years ago um, witnessed the revival of Temascal in the coast of Veracruz in a little Nahuatl community where it had disappeared for generation. And they invited a specialist from the capital of Mexico City who went to teach them. And they gave to the Temascal uh, a ritual meaning that had to do with wedding. So newlyweds should spend the first night copulating in a Temascal bath house because this gave to their sexual action a sort of spiritual uh, new age strength that made them more fertile and more apt to conceive new lives after the wedding. Something that is very different from what happens in the, let's say, uh, I want, don't want to use the term authentic, but the uh, traditional communities who have kept doing Temascal without needing to read the books about ancient Temascal or having uh, new age masters coming from the capital city. And so I was wondering uh, if you could uh, perceive some specific differences in the way the Temascal revival has gone through in uh, Mexico, like in rural Oaxaca or Michoacán, where you also witnessed it, and Europe. So there are many ways of reviving these traditions and reinventing them, no? I think that something that they both share, either in the area of uh, New Age Mexico, either rural or urban, and in Italy, is different ways of re-enchantment, of... Uh, an action that goes mystical in a certain sense, no? Um, thank you for reminding us that ritual does have this multiple ways of reinventing itself and in many different places. Uh, I wonder if anybody else has uh, another question, a comment before I pass on? Please, Cecilia. It's, it's more like some questions to put on the table. I mean, invited me since we didn't have time in the previous panel to, and I think there were transversal themes that came up also in these panels. So when uh, we we wrote the, the we uh, pre imagined the, the, the topic of cooperation within uh, this conference, uh, we were wondering to what extent this idea of cooperation, collaboration is useful, what, what are the limits that we encounter, etc. So 
in the previous panel some uh, a theme that I think was transversal in more or less all the papers was this idea of overlapping in individuals in buildings like the one Emily described. So this idea also of multiple levels of cooperation. So um, I think that imagining maybe cooperation, I don't know what you think, but imagining cooperation um, as a, a complex assemblage of uh, coexistent, co coexistence, conflict, and even juxtaposition could be interesting. I don't know if we want to share ideas on, on this uh, aspect. Then something that also, I think, uh, came up also in this last panel is uh, this idea of representation and also the, the our, and also yesterday, of course, our role uh, of ethnographers as observers on the one hand, but also as uh, productors of uh, representations. So the, the movies, uh, the images, the pictures, and what are the, the um, ethical implications of the, the, um, the representations we produce, both written, uh, visual, et cetera. I think it's an interesting topic and how, so in the case of the previous panelists, how, what are the implications of the ways in which um, we represent cooperation, but we can extend this question even beyond the, the concept of cooperation. Um, Helmar talked about autoethnography, and I think it's also a very um, interesting topic that we didn't address much today, but I think it's super interesting also to see how we represent ourselves, to what extent it is useful to represent ourselves, and what we, the, the ethnographic uh, outputs we produce. Um, and yeah, the, um, of course, I'm very interested in this idea of gap treatment, gap, uh, and to what extent we can oppose it to when, especially when we um, confront ourselves with uh, alternatives, what we represent as alternatives, to what extent it makes more sense to talk about differential gaps, so not, not so much uh, uh, something that is missing, but a multiplicity of things that is actually there. Thank you. We also have a question online. Um, I don't know if the person who wrote the comment here would like to open his or her mic and ask the question. Do you want to type your question? You can certainly add a comment. Hello, can you see me? Yes, we can see and hear you well. Oh, my name is Karen Rohanki and I am from India. Uh, I am from an indigenous community, the Garbi community from northeast, the northeastern part of India. So there was a question that was asked, uh, if, if in entities or in indigenous communities, can they be aggressive and they can they like cause that? So I would like to address that. Uh, in my community, yes. Um, uh, because in my community, we believe that there are lots of entities everywhere around us. So, and we believe in, in, um, in aura, in energy. So whenever there, because people, uh, and also we consider the body, uh, like our body as a medium, as a vessel. And uh, because of that, we uh, believe in energy and energy can sometimes be high or sometimes be very low. So whenever a person has low energy, and then since, uh, like, like I've already said, the entities are everywhere. So during that time, if you happen to maybe go out somewhere where the air is, uh, we say the air is bad. So where, if you go there, and during that time, if you happen to somehow get in contact with the entity, then yes, that entity might somehow influence your body, your mind, uh, and also your um, physical health. And somehow it might affect you directly or indirectly. So, <laughs> and sometimes, yeah, this, this might even uh, cause that. Um, I have had actually a personal experience, uh, even in my family, uh, with one of my cousin brother, who have had an, encou uh, an encounter with an entity, uh, which was in our backyard, actually. 
So, uh, and then um, later on, because of that, he became very ill and then he passed. So this is what we believe. And uh, I just wanted to share it since uh, the question was put up there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, we have one more question or commentary. Oh, can you come over here, please, Hoje? <laughs> I don't know his name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, may I sit here? Yes. Yeah. Please. I can move over and you can. It's more comfortable. It's, it's more, more polite for those watching through <laughs> not to give my back. Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to add some uh, comments about this concept of trust and also to respond to Serena's uh, question. As, as it has been said, we are. Um, we are conducting a project called Visual Trust, no? And there's a category uh, uh, which interests Emily as well. So um, what I think interesting about this category of, of, of trust and that you have raised this question very well is that it is a very action-oriented category. I mean, action, um, trust has to do with action. It's a very relational category. I mean, you can, in this regard, this is different from truth, for example. I mean, you can say that something is true or not. And you get uh, the truth is here or not. But I mean, trust is different. You can trust something or someone without being sure if it's true or not. I mean, this is the provocation I suggest. And this is very common in religious pluralism. I mean, and we, and those working in Latin America, like me, I mean, uh, the people try different things. Okay, I go to a Santero, but I go to the hospital as well, but I go here and there. And so, and so you, 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 you test. And it's, it's, it's a matter of trust, much more than a matter of truth in this sense. And, uh, and, and another thing is that trust goes with mistrust. They go together. And actually, in, in English, we have these two, two words, distrust and mistrust, which is not totally the same as well. And um, in the fact that usually we trust without being totally sure of, of, of if it's going to go well or not. Uh, and sometimes even mistrust is interesting as well is appealing yeah? um so for example um there is trust in visibility but also there can be trust in invisibility as for example the film by eloise has shown and so in relation to this project visual trust you were saying uh, what's the methodology no because i mean it's difficult to carry out ethnographies of trust and mistrust there is a, a book on that no uh, there's a growing literature on trust but for example, we have an article published in this uh, journal called Anthrovision, which is about anthropology and the visual with the methodology of this project. No, But of course, one thing is what people say, I trust this or this, or I trust my visions or not because these are misleading. But you have to also to observe the actions that this act of trusting entails. I mean, well, and 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 so it has to be very, mm, uh, uh, very focused on, 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 for example, in in images. What, what do people do with images? And through images, if you go to a doctor and the doctor shows you an image of your lungs and lungs and say, okay, this is not good at all, and then you change your way of living. This is a way of trusting this image. You see, and uh, but there are also other possibilities. I mean, for example, we were talking about collaboration. So about participatory methods as well. So for example, um, involving people into an active engagement in the research and asking them making images, for example, or choosing images of their own environment with whom they inter um, have different relations of trust and mistrust. Uh, knowing that it's always problematic and changing, these can be different methodologies for, for uh, for um, comparing what people say, what people do. And, and, and the important thing is, is what Eloise was raising, I think that images, as well as all other ways of signification, I'm sorry for being so long, is not just representations. They are not just representations. I mean, images do not reflect the world. They do not represent the world. They, they transform the world while, by representing it. In a, in a, so they have this performative effect. And so uh, it is 
it is these effects and, and, and the way they, 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 they are involved in specific actions and relationships that I think we have to grasp within anthropological perspective. Um, thank you, Roger. And I don't, from behind the computer, did anybody else lift their hand? Uh, if I can just make one very quick, and then I'll pass to the to the table, but a very quick commentary. I was one listening to um, you speak now, Roger. I was also thinking that if I mean, we talk about regimes of visibility, and I was wondering if when um, talking about trust, you know, certainly you're clearly moving away from any discussion of, uh, of truth or faith or belief, any of those. And, uh, but you, you, we're talking about, and I wonder if you weren't talking about maybe regimes of efficacy, you know, and that's a way of thinking about it. Because I'm thinking of like a no distinction, like where I work, nobody trusts the spirits. But no, they trust in the spirit, maybe there's a way of putting it, but nobody, part of the efficacy of the, the spirits is not to be trusted. They don't want to be trusted. They challenge you not to trust them. So I'm just wondering if we aren't like how those words are being, uh, whatever word we're using, whatever word we choose, you know, whatever concept, if we aren't what we're dealing with uh, those different dimensions of the performativity of efficacy. And, you know, in some places, faith is the operative word and other places, trust might be the operative word. Uh, tradition might be the operative word. And so I'm wondering if we're dealing with um, the idea of this kind of differential forms of uh, performativity of image or sounds or whatever. I just wanted to comment on that. Um, from my perspective is the trust again was in upholding the, the traditions and the family as community and not even so much from a supernatural stance. Um, he can be trusted because his daughter has a good reputation as well. You know, he can be trusted exactly. And this is because he's a he's performing as a as a, a citizen, for lack of a better word, as a Taman. And it, and again in Nepal, this resurgency of ethnic identity is very important. And um so it's almost reenacting and repeating this set of standards and and morals which um, places the trust. Um, and again, I saw that as the efficacy of the ritual. And it was interesting because when I I first went to the first one, it's like, oh, they're doing a redo, like a do over. Why is he doing a do over? Because I went to see him and says, no, nah, that didn't work. But it wasn't really you know, whereas we might within a biomedical kind of doctor bash, you know, like he doesn't know what he's doing. He wasn't very, he didn't order the test or give me the medicine I wanted. So I'm going to go to another one, doctor shop around. He was just like, yeah, there's another guy. But interestingly enough, he was actually his son, you know, so it stayed within that family, kind of family uh, cohesion in that way. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. A few words because I have already spoken a lot, but uh, um, only to, to answer to the um, suggestion of Professor Lupo. Um, I, I really appreciate the expression uh, re-enchanted because uh, in my opinion is really is really precise to, to describe this this movement uh, of re of reinvention of tradition. Um, and um, I only want to say that, of course, there are a lot of differences between uh, uh, the new spiritual uh, movement, alternative movement uh, that I met uh, here and uh, and there. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the two main differences, in my opinion, are that one, uh, in Mexico, people think, supposed to be original, um, to be traditional, while to be traditional, mm -hmm. while the same practice here in Italy is practiced by people that think to be original, to be uh, innovative. Okay, so uh, I think that is one of the main points. And uh, the second one that I want to like now is that uh, there people think that healers um, has some special power. Uh, they talk about a, a gift <laughs> from the cosmo. Uh, el, el don, tiene, tiene el don, he or she has the gift. 
Um, while here, all the people think they have a gift. <laughs> uh, they, they talk about themselves uh, uh, as a special group. We are special human beings. Uh, uh, we are uh, in some way elected. We have a mission. So they they assume they all have some special power because they are so few people then uh, really find the truth it's about uh, uh, trust and truth uh, here people use expression as a uh, um uh, it was a lucid dream i was in the truth sometimes i dream of this house of steams i return there during the night i come back to the truth there are literally the word uh, of one uh, of the people I've interviewed, uh, never heard about this in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Well, thank you everybody for this very exciting last panel. Uh, so uh, before you wrap up the conference, Emily is going to have uh, say a few lasting closing words. So thank, thank you. you. Well, apparently I'm still here. <laughs> uh, I just want actually Emily asked me to um, speak briefly about the contributions of the Mahikuhi, you know, as this collective project. But before I say that, I actually just want to speak about the importance of uh, Emily as a <laughs> as a catalyst, you know, because it's true. I mean, it is institutionally, yes, I would do my part of saying thank you and recognizing the importance of Mahikuhi for us in the past few years and even during COVID and having had Emily working with the University of Federal Santa Catarina online and uh, uh, given us, uh, she opened our um, the school year all online, unfortunately. Um, so it, it is, it has been very important. We saw the book yesterday and this, uh, 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 the importance of the financing, funding and support to be able to do this international collective work that joins practitioners, scholars from different institutions. So it's very nice. It's wonderful. It's rare. Unfortunately, we should have more. But I also uh, think that um, Mahikui also worked particularly well in this case because it also chose very well. And it chose Emily, who is a person who is able through her generosity and uh, curiosity to join very interesting people together. And at least for me, it has been a wonderful opportunity to meet a lot of people in the like, three different occasions we've been together in this sort of conference. So I would like, of course, to thank you Sapienza for having us here, Mahikuhi and Emily. Thank you very much for- Yeah, when I asked you to say something about the conference, <laughs> I didn't mean about this. Thank you so much and uh, thank Vanya for uh, accompanying these three years uh, of uh, discussions, uh, firstly in Brazil, then also in the UK through conferences and uh, and here now on uh, Roger Canals, uh, uh, accompanying with whom I had so many discussions online during lockdowns and uh, uh, really, they uh, they inspired uh, a lot of uh, what has been done so far in these three years. But I thank you all because uh, I know that this conference has been quite intense uh, uh, with this REACH program uh, and you kept up uh, until now. And I think that the delicious food helped us. <laughs> And uh, thank you, thank you to all the online participants, uh, uh, also for your patience with patience uh, with the technical issues, but uh, especially for your contributions. Uh, um, I'm impressed by uh, the kind of interest 
uh, on this topic of healing on co of cooperation. Uh, it, I didn't expect to have 200 registered participants. So uh, we, are, we saw them coming online at, in different sessions, but we actually had uh, 200 participants uh, in these four days. And uh, tomorrow we will continue with a, a visual ethnography lab uh, led by Roger Canal. Uh, and uh, on filming them visible, so it's a practical lab uh, dealing with uh, the body movement uh, with the camera in brutal healing. Uh, uh, so it's super fascinating. Uh, as all these contributions uh, were in this uh, conference, so this pushed me to think uh, about uh, what shall we do with it? Because uh, of course the recordings will be online on the Ill Network uh, website, but uh, uh, I'm considering a publication uh, of a volume uh, coming out of this conference. Uh, we have so many contributors, so uh, probably will be a volume with short chapters, uh, but uh, promoting this diversity of visions, uh, uh, visions that were diverse, but they were all in dialogue. So this was surprising. So uh, there are so many parallels that I, I'd like to explore through a volume. Uh, uh, the, as a the potential to uh, to foster new discussions, to inspire new events in this direction. Um, and this is the purpose uh, of the Hill Network, uh, fostering collaboration between scholars in this field, but also the importance of uh, promoting an ongoing dialogue with practitioners in our events, in our publication, and this is the next step. Uh, and it's also the inspiring principle of the uh, Maris Klodowska Curie Fellowship, uh, promoting interdisciplinarity, collaborative and participatory projects. So I think that this, uh, this conference, these events in this conference really succeeded in this, uh, with all your contributions. Um, so for the publication, I was thinking about mid-October, if you wish to be considered for the publication, perhaps uh, to, um, in the light of this discussion, if you want to um, perhaps make some changes to the abstracts and send me uh, a revised abstract by mid-October, and then we can proceed uh, to uh, to put up a proposal and I I wish to um, uh, to uh, that this process will be collaborative in the sense perhaps having having some uh, zoom meetings to discuss also the idea for publication uh, with whom and uh, um, how to proceed um, and finally well I thank uh, the Maris Klodowska actions uh, the European founding uh, of this project, of this conference, uh, for making all this possible. I thank uh, Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, University of Oxford, uh, Sapienza University of Rome, uh, uh, and this department, Sarah's History, Religions, uh, Anthropology, Religions, uh, Arts, and Performing Arts. And I think that after these days here in the conference room, we need some movement. <laughs> so I invite you all, for those who stay today, uh, to have a walk in the city center and explore uh, the historical sites in Rome and perhaps have dinner together. And uh, thank you again for uh, being with us online and in person in this event. Thank you.